Hello everyone, it's great to see you here today. I'm really excited to have this conversation with Dr. Anne-Marie Morse. My name is Claire Wilds Wright and on behalf of the Hypersomnia Foundation, welcome to our Living With series. I'd love to introduce Dr. Anne-Marie. She is the Director of Child Neurology and Paediatric Sleep Medicine at Geisinger Hospital. And she's also an Associate Professor at the Commonwealth School of Medicine. Dr. Morse has significant clinical experience in both paediatric and adult patient services in sleep and weight disorders, particularly central disorders of hypersomnolence. Dr. Morse developed the Wake Up and Learn school-based sleep education service, which provides sleep education and screening tools for students in middle school, high school, and now at college and more recently has been appointed to the Board of Directors at the Sleep Research Society Foundation. If you don't know Dr. Anne-Marie Morse, please do follow her on social media at Dam Good Sleep. That's D-A-M-M, Good Sleep, standing for Dr. Anne-Marie Morse. Uh, she regularly posts very good content, and I recommend highly that you do follow her on social media. So without further ado, again, usual thanks to our sponsors. That's Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Avidel, Harmony Biosciences, Takeda, Sintessa and Zevra and of course the Hypersomnia Foundation who have given us this opportunity to share such great content with our wonderful community. So welcome Dr Morse. Dr Amory Morse, I am so excited to chat with you. Um, longtime friend, colleague, peer, all the things, but I wanted to formally introduce you to our community. Uh, for those that haven't met you, probably most have on social media um, and at other places, but um, for the sake of those that haven't, I want to introduce you as uh, Director of the Child and Neurology um, and Paediatric Sleep Medicine at Geisinger um, Hospital. You're also an Associate Professor and Faculty Member of the World Sleep Academy. So welcome to the Hypersomnia Foundation video series. I am super excited. I've got a lot of questions for you. I hope you're ready. <laughs> you're I'm ready. I, I, I almost okay. lost sleep last night with, with the amount of excitement and anticipation. <laughs> but um, because I know how important getting a good night's sleep was, I made sure that I kind of used all my strategies that I know to be able to get those right number of hours and quality sleep. Yeah. Actually, I just watched a video you did about your sleep which was really interesting because there was one night where you woke up recently, like around three, I do that all the time and I lay in bed and then you got up and you did this wonderful kind of explanation of like the benefits to getting up and seizing the day rather than lying in bed and getting all anxious. So it was really interesting to hear your personal perspective, but that's, that's kind of one of the things you do so well, right? Is you kind of weave your personal experience in with your expertise. So I wanted to jump in and just ask you what it was that motivated you to a, two questions really to become a sleep specialist but also to also become an advocate. And then how did you marry those two? Because that seems to be a very unique space that you occupy. Sure. So, so I think I'm going to take you on this journey even a little bit further back. So um, even before discussing the consideration of becoming a sleep specialist, why did I become a doctor and specifically a neurologist? And, and that reason was based in, in a, a family experience. Uh, my mom was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and uh, she was diagnosed about six months after she gave birth to my younger brother. At the time, she had a very dense sensory, weak, sensory deficit and weakness on her one side that had confined her to a wheelchair. Now, mind you, I was five years old. I don't recall this whatsoever. It was also at a period where we didn't really know much about multiple sclerosis, and she was told, uh, we're going to give you steroids. If you get better, great. If not... You probably won't get any more bad flares because you're not going to have any more kids. And so my mom, who had four kids and was a stay-at-home mother, said, okay, well, mind over matter. Um, and so by the grace of God, she, she did well. Um, uh, despite that, my mother never wanted to go back to another neurologist because she said, what's the reason? They can't do anything for me. Right. And so I witnessed my mom over the years, um, despite not having any recollection of that time, uh, experience multiple flares. Um, uh, there were times where she couldn't walk well, she couldn't swallow well, she couldn't speak well, et cetera. Um, and she lived her life denying that she had this condition. So much so she would go to a doctor, ask past medical history, she would say, I have migraine. I'm like, mom, you have multiple sclerosis. You have to tell them this, right? So 
in, in witnessing that, that was the basis of me wanting to become a doctor. I wanted to influence other people's lives so they didn't live this journey of having to choose denial, having to choose to go it alone, having to kind of choose that their diagnosis doesn't have a treatment and therefore I shouldn't have hope, right? Mm-hmm. What my mom missed out on was the fact that not too long after she was diagnosed, was there actually treatments of disease-modifying agents? And now it's a field where there's over 30 different drugs available. And, and the ex- expectation in regards to that control is, is tremendously different. So I went into the field of neurology with, with that in mind and, and ended up in pediatric neurology, really because of a, a young girl who also had multiple sclerosis, who allowed me to appreciate um, the experience of what a good physician can do. Um, and, and really, and, and just kind of be succinct in, in what that experience was, is that she had shared that despite her having significant disability due to her multiple sclerosis, it was her neurologist who made her feel like life was possible. So with that, I pursued a career in pediatric neurology. And during my training, one of the things that I had identified was that recurrently, every single patient I saw for neurology problems had sleep problems. And that recurrently, when I would ask those questions, I was met with, well, that, that's not, that, we'll, we'll deal with that after we deal with the stroke. We'll deal with that after we deal with the ADHD. We'll deal with that after we deal with the epilepsy, right? And so it was kept being viewed as the secondary and optional thing. And, and my perspective was that this isn't secondary optional. Sleep is a neurologic process. We should be utilizing this. We should be utilizing it as a diagnostic tool, a prognostic tool, a therapeutic intervention. And so that led me to want to pursue a career in um, sleep medicine. And as a neurologist, I specifically wanted to pursue a training in a neuro-based sleep program. And ironically, uh, I was in New York, and the big neuro-based sleep program was at Montefiore in the Bronx. And uh, the program is run by Dr. Imran Ahmed. But the name that many people in the Hypersomnia Foundation probably know is Michael Thorpey. When I went there, it was also the time that Jazz Pharmaceuticals was doing the clinical trial for Xyrem in pediatrics. And that was my initial opportunity where I really got not only an exposure, obviously because of Dr. Thorpey's practice, to so many people with different hypersomnolence disorders, but also the similarities that I've seen other people experience, like my mom of kind of being dismissed, of feeling like there's a lack of options, the experience of disability, choosing whether or not they're going to go it alone versus have a partner. And so through that, um, uh, there has been ongoing opportunity that has reinforced to me the importance of advocacy. As a sleep fellow, one of the very first people I met was Julie Flygar at the Sleep Research Network meeting. This was when Julie was was just getting Project Sleep off the ground. In fact, she was still working for the Pancreatic Cancer Society. Um, And Julia and I reflect frequently on the fact that we met each other in both of our infancies and have been able to see each other mature. And as I've continued forward in my own um, personal career, I'm constantly reminded of how important it is to be a part of the patient voice and to put the patient first and not me as a provider first. Um, And the reception that I've had with taking that stance has only further bolstered me to say, Mm -hmm. this is the right path because you wouldn't be going with, with so many people locking arm in arm with you if you're choosing going in the wrong direction. Yeah, it's really significant. And I think um, I've also known Juliet Project Sleep for our audience that aren't familiar with Project Sleep. Um, do check out do check out the website and all Julie's advocacy work and education. Um, and really that commitment to raising the patient voice, which is um, also elevated by your work. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you've sort of interacted with social media and what power that's given to advocacy for you specifically? Sure. So um, when you look at the clinical practice for most providers, um, you generally will hear them uh, joking about how, oh, well, don't mistake your Google search with my doctor's degree, right? Um, There's (laughs) even this cynicism and arrogance of that Mm -hmm. the internet doesn't doesn't have what I have to offer, where in fact, if if you put in multiple symptoms, 70% of the time, Google actually gets the right answer in the first top three searches. Um, I take a different approach. The reality is, is that people are going to the internet and specifically social media to understand 
what their diagnosis is. They're mm-hmm. wanting that peer mentorship. They're wanting answers. They're wanting to be a part of their own medical journey. So I looked at that and I said, I don't view that as competition or an obstacle. I view that as an opportunity mm-hmm. to further enhance the patient experience. And so the use of social media, and it's been TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, they all have different values, right? So I, the the main area I go to is TikTok. Part of the reason I do that is because I can make videos easily, quickly, and reach a very wide audience. I can share them to different platforms. But it, there's a high level of engagement. So what has been beautiful about it is not only the ability to actually reach a broad audience, but for that broad audience to inform me on knowledge gaps that I had of what mm-hmm. specific struggles they may be experiencing or where there may actually be this opportunity for whether it's new research research considerations or new clinical considerations, et cetera. So I find that there's the opportunity of reaching the population at large Mm -hmm. through things like TikTok and Instagram. But the part that I also find very interesting is you can use a professional platform like LinkedIn and use those same exact videos. And sometimes it's a jarring experience for those other key stakeholders of going, oh, wow, that really is putting a mirror up to me and recognizing that Mm. I could do better, right? Um, Or here's a missed opportunity and we need to redirect the ship. Mm. Yeah, LinkedIn is quite a different uh, platform, isn't it? It sort of feels more professional, but good for you for sort of bringing um, all your other pieces into that platform. I can imagine that is a little bit of a wake-up call. What's your response been like from your peers and colleagues in industry with you kind of straddling this unique space between clinician expert um, and patient advocate through social media? I would say that it's been met with nothing but um, a positive experience. It's very funny because um, by no means do I consider myself any type of major influencer, et cetera. I have a ways to go before I reach that. Uh, but but very frequently, just because it is so unique within this space, it is met with like, oh, the TikTok superstar. Oh, you need to see her on social media, et cetera. Uh, <laughs> in, so my own, in my own hospital system, um, uh, they very much look towards me as as what are you doing? We want other physician advocates to kind of model the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's been met with very positive praise. I think it the industry partners, um, they also are identifying that this is a unique space, right? Mm-hmm. They want to understand the patient voice. They want to address the needs of those individuals. Um, and so that is, has been well received by them as well. Not the reason I do it. Uh, the reason I do it is driven by being able to deliver information to a large uh, group mm-hmm. of individuals and, and learn mm-hmm. from them. Um, but I have to say, I've been very pleasantly surprised to see that there really haven't been naysayers. Mm. I'm so glad to hear that too. One of the things that strikes me about kind of terminology in these really unhelpful um, phrases we have, the actual names of the diagnosis like idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy, um, to what extent, because of course we're trying to find patients, we're trying to help patients um, reach their diagnosis quickly. And if you think about it, they're never going to type in, you know, idi- you know, I'm sleepy. Oh, let me just type in idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, to what extent do you feel like the social media reach has kind of reduced those barriers to people finding that they actually have a formal, you know, they're on a journey towards a formal diagnosis and yet these sort of really peculiar words don't resonate until someone like you kind of breaks down those barriers. So I think that that is a recurrent theme that I'm encountering. Um, what I, one of the call to actions that I think is really important, and I've learned this through actually observing a variety of different groups, whether it's advocacy groups or the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, is that instead of leading with specific diagnoses, really trying to package into what are the things that should make you just go, huh? And so uh, one of the drivers would be saying, instead of talking about obstructive sleep apnea or narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia, let's talk about things that you may relate to. Are you getting the right duration, the right quality, the right timing of your sleep, or are you just having features of dysfunction during the day that are just dissatisfying to you, right? When you put it that way, that is a very approachable conversation starter. Mm -hmm. And it allows people to start digging into it. 
you are 100% correct that there are these very, very exquisite barriers. When you talk about narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia or even terms like cataplexy, there is such a disconnect. Idiopathic hypersomnia, there's people who have that diagnosis and they still think that someone's waiting to figure out what's wrong with them right? Mm -hmm. They don't realize that it's actually their medical diagnosis, that that is the condition that they have. So they, they're, they're still trying to understand, okay, well, what is the cause of this, right? Um, and as a field, yeah, we would all love to know the cause of it. Uh, similarly, the number of people who I've met who tell me that they have narcolepsy, but I also have a diagnosis of cataplexy, um, thinking that they're separate entities um, and not that cataplexy is a symptom symptom of what narcolepsy is. Mm. And so mm. there are a lot of these things that I think are ongoing barriers. And I think those barriers are not existing just in the lay population or, or the community at large. Mm. Those barriers are existing in medicine. The number of times where you are either in a, in a meeting or a second opinion, et cetera, and, and the person is saying, yeah, they, they said that my, my testing was normal. And I look at the MSLT and the average sleep time was two minutes, but there were no SOREMs. And so therefore they mm. told me there was nothing wrong with me. Um, mm. Or the average sleep latency is, is nine minutes and there was five SOREMs uh, mm. and, and you're going... <laughs> This is narcolepsy all day. Um, and so I do think that there is an extraordinary need for us to really be able to further define what is it that we're characterizing and, and not to sound like a broken record of, of reflecting on my experience with multiple sclerosis, but the same thing has been done there. There is no one test that I do a multiple sclerosis that says, oh, oh I did a spinal tap. You 100% have multiple sclerosis. It's kind of looking at what does, does, does the person's experience look like over time and utilizing the testing to match the clinical experience to say, yes, this is a diagnosis. And, and there's mm -hmm. multiple different areas in neurology where we see that. And for some reason, we really are so hyper-focused on having this one test that is going to 100% give us an answer. And the reality is it, miss, it misses the mark the majority mm -hmm. of the time. Because the MSLT, I'm glad you mentioned it, because the MSLT is somewhat inconclusive often for patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, correct? So in that yes. case, what are the other pieces that you look for as a clinician to confirm a diagnosis of IH if the MSLT isn't giving you the kind of information that you would want? So I think, um, number one, clinical history, first and foremost, has to lead where you're going, right? Um, does the person have features of excessive daytime sleepiness, tell me about that excessive daytime sleepiness. Are they describing that they're avoiding naps at all costs because the fact that the sleep inertia they experience from those naps is worse than, than just <laughs> avoiding the nap themselves? Uh, do they have um, uh, these excessive sleep hours? And so in the United States, this is very challenging to pin down because the fact that many times individuals with idiopathic hypersomnia are prioritizing their other social expectations, work, child rearing, et cetera, that they are not getting those 11, 12, 13 hours of sleep. They might be getting nine hours of sleep and still excessively somnolent, but they don't necessarily meet that criteria of with long sleep time or, or where we're looking for on actigraphy greater than 660 minutes in a day, right? Um, so I, I do want to look at the MSLT and see number one, does it have objective evidence of hypersomnolence, right? So what I mean by that is that we we become obsessed with this idea of, of equal to or less than eight minutes. But the reality is if I have a grown adult in front of me who naps on four or five naps, I don't care if it's eight minutes or if it's 10 minutes, that is pathologic sleepiness. Mm -hmm. Similarly to if I have a person who gives me a story of seizure, and I do an EEG and I don't catch a seizure, but I see an epileptiform discharge, that tells me your diagnosis is seizure. And mm -hmm. so when I have a person who tells me a story that's fitting for IH, but their average sleep latency is nine minutes and they slept on five naps, I'm not going to subject you to more testing just to accommodate the insurance, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's really the only thing that's, that's standing in the way between mm -hmm. you being treated as an individual with a medical disorder 
and um, and 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 better days ahead, right? Mm-hmm. So um, if for some reason MSLT is is just grossly inconclusive, maybe we're we really do have the story of IH, but the MSLT is completely still cold normal for some reason. Other things that I definitely will do is is sleep diaries and actigraphy. Um, uh, we do not have the accommodations in the United States, at least I don't have uh, at the facility that I'm at, where um, we can do the protocols that are being done in Europe, where they're sometimes up to 84 hours worth of a protocol. Protocol. Um, uh, we we definitely don't have the insurance uh, support for us to keep people in uh, sleep labs for that long. Yeah, the insurance thing is such a huge challenge, and I also observe the fact that you're not afraid to call out insurance companies um, for um, perhaps uh, this is not the best word, but sort of I want to say misbehavior actually um, in terms of uh, sure. being obstructive towards patients accessing medication. And that was a recent thing around Sirem, I believe. And um, I wanted to just ask you a few questions about the Oxabate family and what's available, FDA approved, for patients with IH and the differences between Sirem and Cywave. Can you can you illuminate sure. so, us on those pieces? Uh, Sure, sure. So in terms of the Oxibate family of drugs, this is a, a family of medications where we do have Xyrem and Zywave, um, Xyrem being sodium oxibate, Zywave, we, we call it low sodium oxibate uh, because the other molecules that are included in it beyond sodium is, is calcium, magnesium, and potassium oxibates. And so the, the main difference that t- tends to be focused on is the fact that there's 92% less sodium in Zywave as compared to Xyrem which um, uh, for many patients may be extraordinarily favorable um, just because we want to be mindful of how much sodium we're taking in. For individuals with idiopathic hypersomnia, the only FDA-approved drug is, in fact, Zywave. However, we do know that there's clinical trial information that has demonstrated previous to this FDA approval that sodium oxabate also can be helpful in this uh, particular patient population. Um, there was a study that looked at idiopathic hypersomnia as well as narcolepsy and use of sodium oxabate. Mm-hmm. Now, with that stated, one of the things that we've learned from the clinical trial, which was the largest phase three clinical trial done in idiop- patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, Insomnia, has demonstrated that there is a significant improvement in individuals who have IH, irrespective of long or not long sleep times, um, for those who respond to Zywave. And so what I mean by that is when the trial was done, part of the trial, because IH is a rare condition, was that there was an enrichment to the design. So those who went into the randomization had to be demonstrating that they were a responder, so that there was some mm-hmm. uh, improvement. Now, with that stated, one of the things I would say is the, the results I find to be quite impressive because for those who responded within four weeks, there was the ob- observation of a normalization of the upward sleepiness scale, um, which we all recognize is, is faulty um, because it, it has its limitations. However, the other scale that was utilized within the trial was the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale. And the thing that I like about this, although it's not widely used yet, is that it gets at all of the main factors. It gets at what is kind of the daytime symptoms like beyond excessive daytime sleepiness, also thinking about the brain fog, cognitive symptoms, uh, what does the nocturnal symptoms look like, number of sleep hours that are needed, and then what is the propensity for napping. And so it really does does look at a holistic view as of IH. And so when we're utilizing that scale, um, we generally are saying normalization is less than a score of 22 and the scale is out of 50 points. And we saw also at four weeks, there was a normalization of the IHSS. Um, so with the, with the study, uh, the things that I think were, were most remarkable is that number one, we saw normalization of symptoms and both valued by the ESS as well as the IHSS by, by week four. Um, there was statistically significant worsening for those who were randomized to placebo. And then on the open label, we saw that there was ongoing benefit, um, not only consistent benefit, but also consistent decline in the severity of symptoms. So so that I think is interesting. The other major point that I like to always reflect on is that when treating individuals who have narcolepsy with oxibate medications, typically we are utilizing closer to a nine gram dose. And and even in some Mm -hmm. patients, I I utilize off-label and higher than that, obviously making sure providing safe parameters. The average dosing used in IH 
was 7.5 grams. And there was a subset of individuals who were able to have once nightly dosing. So there does seem to be a different responder profile um, for individuals with IH. So, um, uh, so I think that's important. Now, with that stated, insurance is most typically um, uh, are starting to play ball <laughs> with approving Zywave for idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, in some patients who have idiopathic hypersomnia, there may be preference for using Xyrem. And the reason I say that is because patients who experience IH, also those with narcolepsy, but perhaps um, uh, those with IH more frequently, may have features of dysautonomia or autonomic instability. And so there's one condition called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, where one of the mainstays of treatment is a high sodium diet. Uh, we recommend four grams of sodium in a day. Uh, and so utilizing a medication that has a higher dose of sodium may actually be more favorable in that mm. population. Mm, that's interesting. Um, so Zywave is FDA approved for IH. Um, what medications are also available off-label for our community? That's a big question. There's probably, so when, I know there's a lot, but the main ones, maybe main, mainly your go-tos that you would um, perhaps prescribe for IH patients that might need something off-label. Sure. So I think that when looking at the approach to IH, at this point, a lot of us will reflect on what are what is our knowledge and experience in, in drugs used in narcolepsy. However, again, recognizing it's not a one-to-one, -one. A, a treating an individual with narcolepsy and treating an individual with IH, there are some unique nuances. And then also to further that point, treating one individual with the, the condition is very different than any other individual. So there are no two patients who are exactly the same. Now, when thinking about the approaches, um, uh, there definitely are the oxabate medications, um, as we mentioned, sodium or low sodium oxabate. The alerting agents that can be utilized, there are, is some data uh, supporting the use of modafinil um, in, the, in the treatment of patients with uh, idiopathic hypersomnia. There's some ongoing clinical trials right now looking at the use of patolescent in idiopathic hypersomnia, and we think that those are going to prove to be favorable outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I see no objection in ut utilizing things like sulriamfetol or armadafinil as well. Now, outside of that, um, the group down in Emory has done some really great research demonstrating the use of things like clarithromycin and flumazenil. And so those are unique that we don't typically reach for when we're talking about the treatment of uh, narcolepsy. Now, one of the other drugs that I do think is really interesting um, that, that, again, when looking at the treatment of narcolepsy, we typically are considering them second and third line uh, medications are, are, are traditional stimulants, so methylphenidates and amphetamines. And so there is one drug that is called Journey PM. This is a delayed release stimulant medication that you take at night. And the onset of the medication is about 12 hours later. I have found anecdotally, and, and I'm discussing the possibility of doing a clinical trial on this, of that when utilizing this medication, whether it's for individual narcolepsy or IH, if there's significant sleep inertia in the morning, it's helpful. It helps them to get mm -hmm. out of bed. It helps them to respond to an alarm rather than needing some sort of tactile stimuli because they're able to take it before bed and then they time it so that the release or onset of it is going to be coinciding when, when they'll be waking up. So I mm -hmm. do think that there's a lot of these other strategies um, uh, that can be considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm hopeful that there's going to be a lot more options for people with IH than there are already existing. Um, yeah, thank you for answering that question. I wanted to jump to um, a conversation perhaps about stigma because this is such also a barrier, isn't it, to patients sort of accepting their um, situation and also perhaps even pursuing medication. And you've done quite a lot of work to reduce stigma. What would you um, say are the main sort of areas that we need to address in terms of destigmatizing sleepiness um, as a barrier to pursuing a diagnosis? So I think first and foremost, we need to acknowledge that in 2014, a CDC declared the United States in a major public health crisis due to sleep disorders. We're a country who wears it as a badge of honor of that, mm -hmm. I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? And and so <laughs> to that, my, my frequent response is, well, you'll just get there a lot sooner. And oh, the, the, the reality is, is that we view inability to function due to sleepiness as a weakness. 
right? And this becomes even more glaringly obvious the more competitive mm. the field you get into, right? So if mm. you're in medical school, law school, residency, et cetera, what do you mean you can't man up and get through this 27-hour shift or you can't do that? So if we in the field of medicine are stigmatizing each other and bullying one another for not being able to get through it and man up enough, then how are we going to role model or even be able to advocate for the general population that this is this is a problem, right? right. And so in addition to that, the number of times where having conversations with teenagers, for instance, and talking mm-hmm. about sleepiness or even young adults and talking about sleepiness and, and why that's a pathology and no the reflection or the perception is it's normal. And the reality is, is that it's not normal. It's common. It's very Mm. common, but it doesn't mean that common is normal. And, and this has been even responses that I've gotten on social media where I had posted a a duet or, or a stitch to a video of a, of a student, uh, of a teacher ridiculing a student for sleeping in the class Mm. and, and basically providing the redirection that, that, that really is not the way to go. Like if, if someone is falling asleep in class, number one, don't take it as an insult because the whole concept of I only sleep when I'm on board is a farce. Mm-hmm. You sleep because you're sleepy, not because you're bored. Mm-hmm. Okay, boredom I doesn't see. put you to sleep. Right. Um, and so the response, one of the responses I had gotten was like, basically, like, cool it, chick. You're like pulling a five alarm fire. It was just a nap. Like everyone naps, <laughs> and I'm like, and then like again, my response is. I'm not making a five alarm fire because of the nap. I'm making a five Mm -hmm. alarm fire, number one, because of the response to the nap. And also to raise awareness, purely further emphasizing the awareness that's needed of that sleepiness is not normal. It's it's horrifyingly common, but it's Mm -hmm. by far not normal. And so I think really the first place we need to go is, is identifying that sleepiness is a problem, that daytime napping should go away by five years of age. If you are requiring naps, that by itself is telling you not necessarily that you have narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia, but you may have a duration problem, a quality problem, a timing problem, or you may have a hypersomnolence issue. Or a lifestyle problem, maybe. <laughs> so you've done a, quite a lot of work, haven't you, in um, young children, middle school, high school, in terms of identifying specifically these issues about falling asleep in the day and also trying to um, seek out those individuals that would you know, perhaps have a diagnosis. Can you tell us a little bit more about those programs that you run um, to address like late starts and sleep health in, yeah, I suppose pediatrics, which is your, your speciality. Sure. Sure. So, um, back in, in 2019, before everything was virtual, um, I had this idea of, of creating a virtually delivered sleep education and screening program for school systems. And so obviously there is a lot of national attention on what time we start school, right? This isn't a problem that obviously we can fix like this. And right. although it's it, there's a lot of good science to support the reasoning and the rationale, there's still this huge debate of how do we accomplish these things. Mm-hmm. And so recognizing that we have an opportunity to provide additional resources to still get at the problem while we're waiting for other solutions to arise, I wanted to be able to say, what else can we do for these students? Because even if we change the school start time, if we're not informing them on why we're doing it and we're not giving them strategies on how to optimize their, their health, as soon as they graduate, you're a senior, you're graduating, you're going to college or you're going into workforce and now your first class is 8 a.m., no one's, no one's delaying that for you, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're going to need to figure out how to be a big boy or big girl and, and get up for that class and, and be able to get the right number of hours of sleep and do all of that. So um, that was kind of the intention of the program, recognizing that the most recent statistics are stating that 58 to 73 percent of middle school and high school students are getting at least insufficient number of hours of sleep. Mm. So we um, uh, were able to receive philanthropic grant funding. Um, so we received a donation from Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Um, so it's a, a, a donation. And my hospital system gave a donation that matched it. 
and we were able to launch this program. So we started with a small mm-hmm. school district with uh, within our catchment um, that had about 500 middle school, high school students. And uh, we rolled out the program. And similar to what was seen by the CDC, uh, 64% of middle school and high school students in our first year had uh, screening features that were suggestive of a sleep disorder. Oh we gosh. now have been in that school district for three years. They do not have a delayed school start time. They start at 8 a.m. And so technically 8.30 or later is considered a delayed school start time. Um, in the first year we did that program, that number dropped to 52%. And we now are around 49%. Oh. Um, uh, so we were like, this is striking. Well, is, is this true? Like, it's survey data. Like, is it, let's let's go to the sources of information, and every single student that we did um, either a focus group or a one-on-one interview with had said the same thing, that it was two pieces, and and the design of the program was intentional to be a change culture program, right? It's not a research program. It's not for me just to gather data. It really is to establish change culture. And so in order to do that, you need to give education a tool. I can give you education all day, but if you don't care and if it's not relevant to you, you're mm-hmm. never going to do anything different, right? So yeah. one of the first and foremost things when I talk about my, my school-based program called Wake Up and Learn is that I never talk about sleep for the sake of sleep. No one cares. We already demonstrated this. We're, we're a sleep-deprived country for however many years. I talk about sleep in, in the capacity of what is relevant to the stakeholder at hand. And so we talk about sleep and its role in education um, for learning, um, mm-hmm. for sports performance, right. for mood stability, for um, recovery from injuries and illness, risk-taking behavior, et cetera. And so what the students said uh, when we asked, like, what did this program do for you? They said, number one, I didn't know I had a sleep problem until I took that survey. I didn't know that my pattern of sleep was problematic. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I should be getting eight to 10 hours of sleep. I thought I was Mm -hmm. good with seven, right? So that was number one, just the awareness of you're not doing as well as you think. The second was, I didn't know it was relevant to my athletics or my school performance, et cetera. And so, uh, that then led to them wanting to do purposeful change. I even had one student say, I now sleep two hours more than I did previous. And so oh. that one student to me is, is such a powerful representation mm-hmm. to the impact where when you give a student, an adolescent, knowledge and guidance and the ability to kind of do that look in the mirror they choose what's within their control to be able to make those differences. And and since then, we've replicated it in in adult learners as well. And then we also have just uh, launched it in December with over 4,000 faculty. Um, And every single time it's met with the same thing because most people, number one, are stigmatized by the idea of acknowledging that they have a sleep problem. Everyone has a sleep problem. And so why should I complain about it? Mm -hmm. They're all doing well. I should just be doing well. Uh, And so it really is starting to create this shift where Mm -hmm. um, we are looking at it as a tool to optimize our day rather than the thing I can curtail to get more done in my day. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, these are really significant um, areas to address. It feels a little bit overwhelming in the sense that maybe there's still so far to go with that. What what do you think needs to happen to sort of really drive this message, which you've done so effectively on a more local level, but to make that have such a big impact nationally, internationally, globally. What what do you think needs to change, Amory, in terms of sort of education and awareness in order for these things to become normal and not um yeah, a badge of honor as you rightly pointed out. Sure. So I think there's there's several approaches that can be considered. When I'm just thinking about the the school level in the United States, I've had multiple conversations with um, school administrators, legislative uh, groups, mm-hmm. Department of Education. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be speaking at the National Association for School Nurses. And, and one of the things that I, I say when I'm talking about the program we've developed is that if you look at the World Health Organization's recommendation on what should be school-based health screening, they generally are basing it on three things. Is that number one, the disorders need to be prevalent. Number two, the disorders need to be screenable. Number three, the disorders need to be actionable. What we have in terms of our program, it's demonstrated that. This should be the call to action, right? We screen blood pressures. We screen for scoliosis. We screen for Mm -hmm. um, uh, heart-related conditions in schools. 
because we're worried about the outcomes that can be associated with it because of the fact that um, there's an intervention. This is the same exact thing, right? Mm -hmm. So making that as a part of a standard would allow for people to start really recognizing it as this is important. Schools think it's important. There's relevance Mm -hmm. to the school performance. There's relevance to the mental health. There's relevance to my outcome as a human being, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, if we were looking at just the population, creating that access to being able to say, what can I utilize to create this change culture? Um, uh, The second piece is, I think, from the medical side of the world, is that we do a horrible job educating and acknowledging sleep. We still, in most medical schools, only spend about three to four hours in four Mm -hmm. years of medical school educating Mm -hmm. about sleep. And it's very, very rudimentary. It's Mm hyper-focused on sleep disordered breathing. We talk about some REM behavior disorder. You may even get a half a paragraph about narcolepsy. But the reality is is that as a Mm -hmm. pediatrician, um, uh, there are... 25% of residency programs that don't even have any sleep curriculum. We look at our academies. We don't have anything about the relevance of sleep um, in a really meaningful way. So for instance, American Academy of Pediatrics, they do have some stances. Put the baby on their back to sleep to prevent SIDS. If there's large tonsils and adenoids, screen for obstructive sleep apnea. And if there's ADHD, make sure there's not a sleep disorder before you start them on a stimulant, right? (laughs) And so uh, there's nothing that is out there, whether it's coming from American Academy of Neurology, Child Neurology Society, American Academy of Pediatrics going, sleep is an unadulterated manifestation of brain health. Mm -hmm. So therefore, whether you're in a neurodevelopmental or neurodegenerative trajectory, look at sleep because it's a part of your day. Mm -hmm. And that may give you some really good insights as to how a person's brain health is doing. And so I think, I think there's, there's even going beyond a neurologic consideration is recognizing that sleep is a homeostatic factor that has relation to every single organ system, every single subspecialty. And we still think about it as like the optional, right? The American College of Cardiology in 2020 said, if you have atrial fibrillation, you should have universal sleep apnea screening. Not you should have a universal sleep apnea screener, but actually a sleep study because 68% of people may screen positive on the screener, but 84% have sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And when we don't uh, treat a sleep apnea, you have recurrent atrial fibrillation. So what that tells you is that we should stop talking about sleep as a comorbidity. Mm -hmm. We should start talking about sleep as your atrial fibrillation management. We should start talking about sleep as your seizure management, about your obesity prevention plan, right? Mm -hmm. This is something that is influencing all those factors. And to measure the outcome of an individual based on how you do during the day is completely arbitrary and missing 33 to 75% of the individual based on their age. Yeah. Yeah, it's striking because I think with sleep health or sleep disorders, it's the one area of medicine that potentially intersects with all others, right? So as you point out, whether it's neurodevelopmental, neurodegenerative, um, cardiac, diabetes, so on and so forth, you know, it, it is the piece that impacts those conditions, usually for the worse, and yet it's seen as a distinct disorder. Um, yeah, when, when <laughs> you're right to point out about, I mean, even when I came into the space or sort of 10 years ago, I think I heard that statistic about um, sleep being studied as in, in med school in the UK for so like less than two hours in sort of a five-year training program. I'm not sure it's improved much, I don't know. Um, but th- these issues are still really quite alarming, aren't they? But on the other hand, our awareness of sleep disorders and sleep health, I think, is ahead of the implementation of what that means to um, really interconnect all the different disease spaces with sleep being central and paramount to that, um, even if you don't have a diagnosis, even if you're quite healthy, um, is still huge. Yeah, I think I think what we've done as a field is we've done a great job of talking about sleep and studying sleep and discussing it with one another who who thinks sleep is cool, um, but we haven't <laughs> done a great job of uh, engaging all of our other partners across medicine 
for them to understand how cool it can be for their outcomes, right? right? We all feel so overwhelmed with making sure we're doing the best thing, the best evidence-based medicine for the outcomes that we're prioritizing. And so therefore, by nature, we're going to secondarily prioritize mm-hmm. sleep because we're not making that connection. And so we really mm-hmm. do have to work on facilitating that. Cardiology definitely is leading the field in this with the American Heart Association, even most recently coming right. out with Life's Essential 8, adding sleep because of sleep duration there. I think um, when you reflect on even just some of the work where we look at sleep disorder breathing, and for years, we just continue to qualify obstructive sleep apnea through an apnea hypopnea index. But you look at some of the work through through things with Alan Pack, for instance, and he clearly has great data that demonstrates that it's not just the severity of your AHI or sleep disorder breathing. It actually is that excessive daytime sleepiness phenotype who Mm -hmm. carries the highest risk for adverse cardiovascular outcomes. So there's clearly a neurodegenerative model there, right? There's clearly something that's telling you your brain's not as healthy if you are sleepy all the time. Mm-hmm. And that then is going to contribute to other downstream effects. And so I think that mm-hmm. also is part of the reason when we're looking at central disorders, hypersomnolence, we're trying to understand what is that chicken or the egg that is related to the other medical outcomes that we see for people who have central disorders of hypersomnolence mm-hmm. um, because it's it's not isolated just there. We're seeing it more broadly. And so there is that call to action for understanding what does that mean? So when we're seeing excessive daytime sleepiness, we know that it negatively impacts us. So we know it impacts our cognition, our mood, our reaction time. But -hmm. there also is evidence that is making the suggestion that that just may be the tip of the iceberg. And there's other downstream effects that may be even more consequential than than what we're realizing. Mm -hmm. What can um, individuals do? Um, I have an idea, but what, what would you say individuals can do to sort of track their sleep health and... I suppose you have to be proactive and preempt potential um, comorbidities, whether that's diabetes or, or even every day, like, you know, memory um, that's lacking or brain fog. What, what would you recommend for people to kind of do in terms of really taking that charge and preempting potential health issues due to lack of sleep? So one of the things I'm always very, I always try to approach this conversation very balanced because the same that we would want to tell people track your health and and uh, track your sleep and uh, consider it in regards to your health is the same caution of saying, telling someone you should weigh yourself every day, right? Because that can be the slippery slope to an eating disorder. The same thing is that you can create the slippery slope of, of a hyper fixation on your sleep. The number of people who I hear have either an Apple watch or whatever else. And there's a sleep score, which I have no idea what their sleep score means. And they're like, my sleep score is not good. I, I must not have slept well. And I, I asked, well, mm-hmm. how do you feel? Well, I feel great, but my sleep good, score yeah. is telling me I shouldn't feel well, right? right? So there's this cautious balance too there of, of the tools that you're u- utilizing and how you're incorporating that into what does it mean? So I think that the the approach I'd recommend people to do is, is again, first saying, is, is there a dissatisfaction that you're experiencing with mm-hmm. either the quality, the timing, how much sleep you're getting, et cetera, or is there a dissatisfaction with how I'm feeling during the day? The second piece is, is really trying to understand what are your patterns? You don't need to do this every day for the rest of your life, but take two weeks and, and say, okay, well, what time do I go to bed? What does my bedtime routine look like? How long does it take me to fall asleep? Um, do I wake up in the night? What time am I waking up? How do I feel when I wake up? When you start kind of understanding those things, that actually gives you a degree of control, especially if your next step is to engage a clinician and saying, I want to make a change for the better, right? Or I want Mm -hmm. further investigations because now you are so well informed about you. You are giving your provider that leg up to make the right decisions with you, right? Of, of, do you need a behavioral specialist or do you need a sleep study? Do you need a medication? And so I always think that the most important thing is for you to be most well-informed about you. Do not depend on someone else Mm -hmm. to tell you what you need, but really start with getting, collecting some of your own information. So whether you're wearing a sleep device, like a, like an Apple watch or Fitbit or any one of these, a whoop, um, or using one of the mats on your bed or another type of app, that's fine. Recognizing there are limitations with all of these devices, but if if it's giving you some idea of what your consistency is from night to night Mm -hmm. for a period of time, I think that's helpful. 
Um, I also think just making sure that you don't create a hyper fixation on what that means for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, because if they're, if you're establishing that that starts to be the reason that you're not sleeping well, yeah. <laughs> then, it becomes, um, yeah. then that obviously is not the right. Yeah. Yeah. I relate to that. I think you, I think you're just about to say, um, you can become hyper fixed and then anxious about it and then you yes. can't sleep. Woo. Big, big vicious circle. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just wondering also how, you know, we have this traditional concept of like, we need eight hours if we're 45 or, you know, nine hours if we're 30 and so on and so forth. Have you got any views on um, that, you know, that sort of consolidated block of time being the best, you know, the optimal sleep uh, duration or whether like historically I think humans have also had blocks of sleep do you know what I mean like three hours and then yep. a break and then another three or four hours I don't know I've been reading about it recently and I'm yeah I'm just I think I'm probably also just linked into my, my daughter's narcolepsy Zyram Zywave pattern so only sleep three hours and I wake up I'm not on Zyram or Zywave but I'm I'm not sure so, so you're right. There, there is a history where there was more of a polyphasic sleep, where there right. were different kind of um, timing. And so some of the theories around why we become so consolidated at night really has to do with really changes in social expectations. Um, and then also the exposure, exposure to light, exposure to things that are going to influence what our timings are. Right. Um, I would say that when we look at neurodevelopmental trajectories of sleep, we generally find that there is significant overlap with how our, uh, the duration and the timing of our sleep and, and how it's fragmented to what our neurodevelopmental needs are, right? So if you look at a brand new neonate who's requiring 14 to 17 hours of sleep, mm -hmm. they're not getting that all at one chunk, right? I know as a, when I was a brand new mom, I was hoping that sometimes that they would just <laughs> sleep for all of that one chunk because I was yeah. exhausted. Um, <laughs> but but it truly is by design, right? Because they're, they're mm -hmm. blank templates, right? Every single thing they're exposed to is a new learned opportunity. And when you're talking about the learning process, it occurs in three phases, acquisition, consolidation, and retrieval. Acquisition and retrieval is what's going on during the day. Consolidation is occurring on, on that sleep period. And so it is very much of advantage for that child to be awake for a few hours and then sleep and consolidate that so that they can build those building blocks. And in fact, if you were to take it from the opposite perspective, we now have a lot of data that demonstrates some of the earliest signs of neurodevelopmental divergence is changes in sleep. Changes in, okay. number one, not having that, that appropriate fragmentation across 24 hours, having a reduced total duration, and even so far as uh, now evaluating different electrophysiologic biomarkers. So we're privileged to be a center that is a part of a, a large multi-center study looking at that specific uh, pattern of can we actually use the signatures in the EEG to be able to say this is a person who's going to be more likely to have neurodevelopmental divergence. So being a biomarker, uh, right? right um, yeah. That introduces the opportunity to make changes. Mm. And so with that stated, when you look at that pattern, right, you have fragmentation, that brand new baby by year of age, you're going to see more consolidation, probably um, a one to, or two to three naps during the day. By the age of five, daytime napping goes away. And so when you think about that from a developmental milestone perspective, that also makes sense, right? right. By the age of five, I am moving away from acquisition of developmental milestones that are egocentric. I'm learning mm -hmm. how to walk. I'm learning how to talk. I'm learning how to use the potty by myself. I'm mm -hmm. learning parallel play. I'm not necessarily interacting with you. By five, it is very important for me to have interactive play. It's very important for me to be awake and attending school, right? right? So there are social determinants that are, that are also influencing that pattern, right? Mm -hmm. And so then we are going to continue to see that over time, we require less and less sleep. Now, with that stated, I don't think that there is a one size fits all. Um, I think we have good ranges in, in regards to what's the right number of hours sleep. So when you're talking about your kind of high school students, eight to 10 hours, that doesn't mean that I can get away with eight hours of sleep and that's the right number of hours of sleep. If I'm a person who I need nine hours of sleep, mm -hmm. the nine hours of sleep is what you need. And when you're getting eight, it's insufficient. And so I frequently tell people as an adult, we should have seven to nine hours of sleep. I know when I'm getting seven hours of sleep, I'm not as good as I am as when I'm getting seven right. and a half to eight hours of sleep, right? So right. even though right. that's age appropriate for me, right. I know the difference of what my performance is. And so for others, they would say, well, you're still, you're still performing well, but it's not my best. And so right. again, recognizing that individually and utilizing that as a tool rather than feeling, man, they're getting away with six hours of sleep. 
I must, I must be a loser. I can't do that. I can't get yeah. away with that. I'm not performing as well. Yeah. Use that as your own superhero power, right? You sleep as your superhero power. Mm-hmm. Know what your right number of hours of sleep is. Utilize that and perform your best. Yeah. Sleep is nature's balm, isn't it? Um, I could talk to you for hours. I hope I will actually in the <laughs> next few months when we meet at conferences. But um, thank you for this really helpful conversation um, on behalf of the Hypersomnia Foundation and people with uh, IH and actually all sleep disorders. So um, I do want to say to our audience, actually, please follow Damn Good Sleep. That's D-A-M-M, Good Sleep. And that stands for Dr. Amory Morse. Um, on all social media platforms. Um, I love I love all of them, TikTok, Insta. It's just it's awesome. Um, yeah, and thank you for being bold enough to step into the patient's shoes and take on these um, bigger challenges with insurance companies and always standing for what's right and true and best for the patient and our community. Huge respect for you, huge gratitude as always, Amory. Um, thank you for your time. I'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm very appreciative to yeah. all of those individuals who entrust in me their stories and allow me to advocate on behalf of them. Yeah. So it is definitely a, a, a mutual appreciation and respect. Yeah. There. Actually, you do also answer very individual questions on social media, don't you? Because you put the little question at the top. Yes, I do. And then you're like, yeah. And then you say, I'm not your personal doctor, but I'm just going <laughs> to, I love that because these, these are no, really I'm, huge. I'm not, but I'm going to give yeah. you some guidance. Yeah, yeah. it's huge because yeah. actually they're asking questions that are often, you know, what's on everyone's mind. Sure. So yes, you have to be the newest forum that I've just started to enter more into is actually Reddit. There's a huge community there. Yeah. Um, and I was so, I was so humbled because there was uh, a, a user on there who is like, I found out that Dr. Morris is on here. And so I'm going to tag her. I'm hoping she answers. She has yeah. really good Instagram. And so yeah. it was, it was, it was so cute. I was so humbled by it. Yeah. And obviously I, I, I answered, um, but it, it, it informs me. Like I, I truly feel so um, uh, privileged that people value my opinion um, and guidance um, and that I get to be a part of, of other people's journeys. It really yeah. is quite a humbling experience. Yeah, it really, it does come across that you listen, um, but also I think that unique space between addressing the individual and the collective um, questions at such a time when uh, sleep medicine hopefully is progressing and progressive. Um, and you're a huge part of that. So again, thank you. And um, I'm going to see you soon, friends. See you soon.